Good morning. Glad to see some of you back and I missed you. And I want you to know that I missed you. And, uh, you know, this thing is not going to be forever, and I know that it isn't. The Lord will keep you while you're here even. And uh, we are trying to keep a safe space for each of you. But, you know, I know that the Lord is gracious. He says that He will heal us of all of our diseases. But that means you can get them. So you have to ask for it when you, when you get them and that kind of thing. Today we're going to be talking to you about radical acceptance. And this is a revelation, a perfect love revealed. We've been talking about love for the last uh, two weeks. And today we'll carry it a little further than that. And I want to, I want to go into the scripture with you. And uh, I want to talk to you about what radical lo love does. And uh, we're going to go and we're going to look at Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's where the problem is. There is no greater commandment than these. The problem in this verse is not God. It's not the revelation of His radical love toward us. The problem is in the person that has not the revelation that God has an unconditional love toward you. That Jesus Christ died to save sinners. To take all of the world's sins, not just people that go to church and are religious. But all the world's sins were put on the back of Jesus Christ because God Himself says that He wanted no person to perish. None. And we're supposed to have the same. I know there are times that you thought, well, God, in this particular case, I'd like for that person to perish. <laughs> you know, but that's not, that's not uh, God's plan for things. He wants you to have His Spirit when you... Uh, gave your heart to the Lord and you followed Him in baptism. That's uh, dying to yourself and resurrected into the life of Christ. And that spirit, you become a partaker of a divine nature at that point. Or supposed to. Nevertheless, we have this old man that's passing away. Passing away in the term of passing away means that the individual is not completely perfect at this point. There's a sanctification process and a work of God that's being done to instill in that person the very Spirit of God and to change that person from what they were, where they came from, and the way that they think and believe. God has to change. Even religious people have belief systems that are not in concourse with God. And so because of that, God wants us to, to listen to the Holy Spirit, get this revelation that God approves of you at all times. At all times. Now, if you've got that, then things change in your life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There is no commandment greater than these, God said. But the problem again is that you were born a human a fallen individual, and you have imperfect ways. And because of that, and I have imperfect ways, and because of that, we have to have the perfect God who comes and lives and dwells in us by His Holy Spirit and increases our knowledge of His will concerning us. That will touches everybody that we come in contact with. God has to give us His character to deal with humanity. All of us have had uh, upbringing that was not perfect. Because of that, our upbringing has affected how we look and see and what we believe, how, what you do, and what kind of actions you take with all people around you. How many of you know that you don't deal with people perfectly and you don't love perfectly if you don't know how to love yourself perfectly? There's a problem in this because, again, that is the fallen nature that is always trying to be perfect 
but always failing at perfection because it has a learned nature. It has a learned, uh, uh, you know, all the actions that they saw when they were growing up. That's what's still contained in the brain. That's the reason that the Father says that we have to have our mind renewed. Our mind has to be renewed in Christ Jesus. What He said that the Father's will was concerning us. So today I'm going to ask you to do something with me. Here it is, an exercise in self-love. Now this is going to be hard for some people, see, you know, because we, we were born sinners. And we don't think that, we, we think that God meant when you judge yourself, you're supposed to do that critically, horribly critically. And if you were raised in, in a, a condition where people were not nice, uh, they were they are abusive and that kind of thing. You can you can actually get yourself into a situation for the rest of your life that you look at all of humanity through your misguided judgment, and then you do that to yourself as well. So first of all, I want you to take your left hand, and I want you to put it over your right shoulder, and then I want you to put your right hand over your left shoulder, and here's what I want you to say. Uh, repeat to yourself, I love myself, I appreciate myself, and I forgive myself for not being perfect. God's already done that for me. <laughs> you see, but you have to do that too. Because until you do, you're not walking in the perfection and the, and, and the things that God wants. Now, we're going to change the, the direction, okay? Take your right arm and put it over your left shoulder. And put your right, I mean, your left arm over your right shoulder. And here is what I want you to say. Tell your evil twin <laughs> you love and appreciate him or her. <laughs> you, you know everybody's got an evil twin, right? <laughs> A uh, darker side, right? Okay, thank you for that. I hope everybody was doing that at home as well. So, uh, we're going to go on. Rejection. How many of you know that rejection is un uncomfortable and self-rejection is more uncomfortable? How many of you have ever been self-rejecting? The way you judge yourself. The criticisms. Because, see, you don't know that God has taken care of all you don't like about yourself. And you're still trying to be approved of on the basis of what you do instead of what He said to do. It's a law unto yourself that causes your rejection to rise up in you. And then as long as you are in self-rejection, there's no way you can love yourself and there's no way that you can obey God because He requires you to, to love others as He loves others. Amen? Amen? So if we don't have love perfected in us, we've got, we're going to have a problem. The side effects of, of this self-rejection are unacceptable. Here, here are those side effects. Loneliness, anger, Fear. Actually, I should have reversed that because anger comes out of fear. Anxiety. Anger comes because people uh, are angry. They're fearful that something is going to be taken away or somebody's not going to like them or somebody's not going to approve. And they get angry because of that. And so anger, fear, fear is the root of all anger. Anxiety, you know, rejection is a part of that. Uh, and, and depression. And many of us try to deal with uh, the side effects, but we don't get to the root cause of what's affecting our love. Love for ourselves. Love for others. We can handle the side effects for a little while, but no, we never break free 100% healthy until we deal with the root. So what is the root? We're going to look at that. The secret of overcoming the root of rejection is found in what I call radical acceptance. What is that radical acceptance? It's a God who is holy and perfect, 
who says to you, I accept you just as you are. And how many of you have ever sang that song, Just As I Am? Without one plea. You know, but what does that song do? It reminds you of your imperfections. But God wants us to remind, uh, wants to remind us that He has taken care of every imperfection. He loves you just as you are. So radical acceptance means that at your core you're deeply convinced and assured that you are accepted and loved unconditionally by God. What does unconditionally mean? You can't do anything to be approved of. There's nothing you can do. So that all, all of that's going to be very hard for people that, that are trying to live up to a standard that is impossible for them to live. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory, not me in me, the hope of glory. I need to love me and forgive me because He's forgiven me. I need to have a revelation of the love that God has given to me. And it needs to be, I need to be deeply convinced that God is God and only God can do that for us, right? Can you do that for me? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Only through Christ. And I'm going to show you how you can because you are commanded to do that. There is no greater... These are the two commandments that God gave to us through Jesus Christ. And when He tells us to keep His Word, that's what He's talking about. Learning to have that divine nature, having a relationship with God on a daily basis. Not a, a distant relationship, not a quick relationship, but a, a, you know, the relationship that God created you for. He wanted to walk with you, talk with you every day. And He wants to infect you, if that's, that's not a good word, affect you with, with His character. You know, on, on a day where COVID is out there, that's, that's probably something I shouldn't have said anyway. <laughs> I want to give you a, a scripture. This is an amplified, the newer amplified. And it's, it comes from Hebrews 13 and 5. The AMPC version says, God says, I will never under any circumstances desert you nor give you up nor leave you without support nor will I in any degree leave you helpless nor will I forsake you or let down or relax my hold on you assuredly not. Now that is the Word of God. What is God saying to you? And see, Amplified actually takes every one of the, you know, the nuances of, of, of Greek and it, it separates those things out for your knowledge. So you look at it, you know what God is actually saying. Now that's what I call radical. That God can love you no matter what. No matter what you've done. If you ask God to forgive you of all your sins, how many do you think He's going to forgive you of? All. The numbers don't matter. Is there anything too difficult for Him to forgive? There's nothing too difficult for God in any means. So when, when we let this kind of acceptance take root in our lives, we will see the side, of, uh, the side effects of our personality change. These things will change in us so that we can be kind, respectful. Now here's the game changer. Regardless of what others... Uh, think or say God does not need you to change for Him to, to accept you. He does not need you to change. Who changes you? He changes you. It's not possible for you to change yourself. You wouldn't know where to start. You wouldn't know how to do it. And so because of that, God is the one that has to do that in us. That work that He starts, He completes. It's not of man, it is of God. Salvation is of God. It's not of man. You can't will it to be. God willed it to be. And that's why He sent His Son into the world. If He gave His only begotten Son, what would He withhold from us? He says nothing. If He and, and, and the Father are, are in collusion with each other so that they had this plan before we came here, He did that and who's going to judge us if we do that which He says? And he tells us that through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. So listen to me. This is where we, we've got to realize that God doesn't need me to change. He needs me to yield to Him so He can change me. 
He has to do a recreation in my mind and He has to do a recreation in the spirit of my heart. Amen? So God doesn't love what is washed. He washes what He loves. And He loves man. He loved the world. He washes clean. See, and that's not you washing yourself. It's uh, He's washing you. So He loves you. He will accept you as you are. When you get a hold of this understanding that He loves you, then uh, He washes you and makes you a king and a priest according to Revelations 1, 5, and 6. This is radical acceptance and it will take root and overtake every negative side effect of rejection. How many of you know the rejections of your past is the problem that you have today inside? Because you, you've had those rejections, it's had a, a, a significant effect on how you look at people, how you think about people, and how you act with people. Okay, But I want you to really experience the revelation of God's love today, so I can't wait for you to feel God's love in a tangible way. This will take you deeper into God's love and acceptance and will help you to break free from the rejection once and for all. If you sit around thinking, I'm going to hell if I don't change, I'm going to hell in a handbasket, listen to me. You need to get that out of your, your dialogue. Who wants you to go to hell? Only Satan. So if that's in your, your, your vocabulary, get rid of it. It's something that you don't need to be talking about. God, God's love was granted to us. It was free. And the salvation is a gift of God. And it's free as well. And the grace of God is, is, and the mercy of God is a gift of God. And it's free. So free you don't have to pay for. You don't have to do. So let's go on. I'd like to begin with a quote that's pr pretty much anonymous, although I've seen versions of it uh, from Christian philosophers and other philosophers that have that taken off with that. Uh, this is it. Our thoughts become words. Our words become deeds. Our deeds develop into habits. And habits harden into character. Habits harden into character. And character gives birth to destiny. So, let's look at that from a moral standpoint. You've got to watch your thoughts and, with care and let uh, them spring forth from love and respect for all beings. All beings. Well, I don't like those people and I don't like these people in Washington. I don't like those talking heads. Well, you don't have to like them. You have to love them. And you have to love them as you love yourself. You can't possibly do that without God. But God will, if you want Him to, change you. How many of you have ever wanted God to take the top of your head and screw it off and put a different brain in there and, and install the hard drive and that He wanted and that kind of thing and make you perfect all at once? Wait a minute. It doesn't work that way, does it? He takes a lifetime to do that, to prepare you for what's coming. So, let's go on. In biblical terms, let's look at it in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, amplified ver uh, version. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize Him, and He will make your path straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. Who makes, you, makes your pathway smooth, straight, uh, removing obstacles? So this is an expression of kismet. Kismet is a word that means uh, that's really saying actions bring upon oneself inevitable results, good or bad, either in this life or the life to come. When you make choices, you're making a choice about who you are going to follow, who you're going to obey. Is obedience still necessary? God expects us to obey Him because He first loved us. Now we can love Him. We didn't love Him first. We didn't find Him. He found us. And because of that, He, he gave everything so that you know, He bought the field with the pearl in it. And so God has done that for us and, and He wants us to love Him back, have this relationship with Him, knowing that 
you know, what He is, we're going to be in the earth also. He's going to give us the ability to have His divine nature. Wouldn't you like to be more like God? Isn't that everybody's desire? It should be if it's not. Because if we don't have that, then we can't certainly uh, obey Him concerning the one or, one or, the, or both of the rules that He gave us through Christ. And those are the two commandments. And what did He say? There's no greater commandments than these. So, kismet is really saying again, actions bring upon oneself inevitable results, good or bad, either in this life or the life to come. So if we keep doing our own thing and not obeying, that isn't God because we have to allow Him to do the work in us to recreate the character of Christ in our heart. Okay? In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, uh, 7 through 10, it says this in the New English translation, Do not be deceived. God is not, uh, will not be made a fool of. If you're reading King James, it says, God is not mocked. For a person will reap what he sows because he the person who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit... Now, he contrasts this. Understand, this is a contrast. But if you give in to what the Holy Spirit is saying, you are not going to do what just pops into your head. That's what it means. So, you know, the person that sows to his own flesh will reap corruption. Corruption won't enter the kingdom. But from the, fle uh, from the Spirit, the one that sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. From the Spirit. A person has to have the Holy Spirit to be born again. And every person that's born again is born again of the Holy Spirit. So, if you sow to the Spirit, that means that you're doing what the Spirit says. So, we must not grow weary in doing good. How many of you know that it's difficult sometimes? People will make you bite your tongue. Nevertheless, God didn't say give to them what they gave to you. He gives us a command to, to be good, to do good things toward them. Pray for them that say all manner of evil against you falsely. I did that for people that threatened me on the Internet, you know, and that kind of thing. I prayed for them. I didn't say, Lord, get them. Well, I meant that. But, I, you know, I, inside I was saying get them, and meaning, you know, collect them and change their ways. Only the Lord can change what a person is, okay? He is the change agent. So, the, uh, you know, of the Spirit, we will reap eternal life from the Spirit, so we must not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, due, due time, we will reap if we do not give up, if we do not give up. That means even when it gets hard. Let me stop just a moment and put something in here. We live in an age where people get married. But they, if they get married, most of them don't these days, but if they get married, uh, they will say just what you said. For better, for worse. And I promise you, marriage will have both of those. And sickness and health. And it will be both of those. For richer or poorer. And I can promise you that. <laughs> but if you don't have God's character, when the negative side of either of the, that on that coin, see, either side, when they want to give up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you and that kind of stuff. Look. God is using that, you know, you know it's, it's grinding out His personality in a person to get them to a place that they have respect and love no matter what the condition of the person that they're with. If you stay together, He says, I mean, even in 1 Peter chapter 3 when He's talking about wives and husbands, He said, you don't want to hinder your prayers. You have to continue in love, steadfast in that love, and just as He did. You've got to love as He loved. Jesus on the cross, talking about radical love, He took before He got to the cross a beating, a flogging with a cat of nine tails. He did that 
And he didn't, I mean, he cried out. It was painful. But he allowed that man who, by the way, was demonized. He didn't just do this a little bit. This wasn't just a little. Uh, he had, you know, in him that demon that wanted to kill Jesus before he got to the cross. And he forgave him. The people that nailed him on the cross, he forgave them. The man that pierced him in the side, the people that, that said all manner of evil against Him falsely accused Him of being a blasphemer. He forgave them. And on the cross He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Isn't that right? So listen, when He says you got to love like I love, that means you can't hold a record of wrongs against those people even if they're doing it right now. If you set your mind that you are justified and having some sort of a spirit other than love, then you're not obeying the Father. You're not obeying the Spirit. The Spirit of God says this, that you're supposed to love them like I love you. You have to forgive them as I have forgiven you. Amen? <laughs> so, let's go on from there. So we must not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people. How many people? All people. And especially to those who belong to the family of faith. All people. What I'm trying to get across, the world, unless it sees the character of Christ in you, they're not going to be convicted. But when they see the character of Christ in you, there is a conviction that comes along with that character. Some of those people will attack you. What will you do when they do? Jesus did not speak to Pilate when he was being accused because he knew that if he spoke to Pilate, Pilate would try to uh, change the course of what was going to happen. And he was set for obedience to the Father. And he wouldn't speak because he knew that Pilate knew that these religious people wanted blood. And, if, and he said, don't you know that I can do something for you? No, you can't. This is the Father's will. He's not going to allow that to happen. See, That is, is the picture that he gave to us. That he loved so much that he laid down his life for his brethren. He said, no greater love than this that you lay down your life for your brethren. Amen? Okay. We all have a habit of repeating behaviors again and again, right? You ever done something over and over because you always did it that way? See, that's not God. That's man. Unless you're doing what you've learned from God over and over, then there's a, there's a problem that you have to deal with. You have to reckon with what you do and how you're living and how you're acting and behaving. When God shows up in our heart, He's trying to get our attention and He's trying to make a change in us every time. So, uh, repeating behaviors again and again is not God's way. Simply put, we're cre creatures of habit. If we've done it before, we'll do it again, right? If it worked for us before, we'll, we'll do it again. People get angry to get people off their back and that kind of thing, and they'll, they'll get angry again. But the Bible says don't, don't have fellowship with people that do that. He called them fools because they, they have to be fools. I, don't, I didn't call them that, see. God did. He said they're fools because they, they are putting away or pushing away the character and the nature of God that God would not do that. He would never do that. And I just read that to you a while ago. So when our habits create our destiny and when our, uh, they are fear-based habits, these habits become a block to accessing all that, uh, that we can be for God. The access is this, happiness. God wants us to be filled with joy and happiness. He wants to give us creativity. He wants us to be uh, so creative that we can be more prosperous than the world is. And He was not going to make it hard on us that was his plan from the beginning. You know this. So these habits become 
a block to happiness, creativity, and a block to all that God has intended for us to become. So, and this is a, a part of me that I, I'm going to talk about. So when, so when I say my deepest expressions of despair come from when someone reminds me of a repeating pattern of pushing away people and grasping out of insecurities which undermine myself or whatever it is that all of my life has hindered loving relationships for as long as I can remember. I'm sure that I'm not the only one that's ever had that problem. I'm sure that every person that has ever breathed has had that problem. When they don't like something, they push people away. When a person failed and they, they judge them, then they push them away. But God let His Son come and die for the whole world, not to push them the way, but to save them, to reconcile all of them to Himself. Are they all going to be reconciled? No. They're going to be people that have rejected Him, and that rejection is on them, not on Him. He did not reject them. He offered them the free gift. A gift has to be received. If somebody, I mean, my, my daughter gave me this red shirt, isn't it pretty, for my birthday. And she and it gave me two, actually, and a, and a bathing suit. I'm not sure about the bathing suit. You know, you haven't looked at my legs lately. So anyway, <laughs> I don't wear shorts or bathing suits, and I don't have a place to go swimming anymore. The pool's gone. But, you know, when, when somebody gives you a gift, you have to receive it. If you don't receive it, and you push it away, what would you feel if somebody didn't receive what you gave to them? Would you feel their rejection? And isn't that what the Lord God feels when people don't receive what He's giving them? He's offering them radical love, radical acceptance, and He says, if you will receive what I'm giving to you, you'll have eternal life. You won't ever die. You'll never see the second death. That feeling of despair raises a question, how can I ever change? How many of you ever said, you know, why can't I change the way that I am? I know that you don't like some of the things you do, and you're more critical than anybody else about you. That's the reason that you're critical of others, is because you don't love yourself, and so you can't love others like you're supposed to. But when that radical acceptance hits and that revelation hits, you can love anybody, and you can forgive them of anything. It doesn't mean that you have to like what they do, but you still have to love them, right? Okay. So today's reflection re uh, will really be on how we awaken from these hab habitual chains of thinking and, and feeling and acting. This stimulus of re uh, re reaction cycle that we get caught up in that really binds our lives. So we've, we've got to get this love of God in us to get rid of that kind of thing. Answer the freedom that comes from faith and not fear. If you still have fear and anxiety in you, it doesn't matter what it is. You, don't, you haven't received what God has said. Did He say that He would forgive you of all your sin? Yes. Did He say that He would heal you of all your diseases? Yes. Did He say that, that He was going to redeem us from our own destructive ways? Yes. So the freedom that comes from faith and not fear, the freedom of responding and not reacting. How many of you know what knee-jerk reactions are? Somebody says and you do. You didn't even think. There wasn't anything between say and do. I teach people, you know, you've got to back away from people just a minute. You've got to take a breath before you even say that. You've got to get oxygen to your brain or you will be doing something you don't want to do. And you will have to deal with it and you can't run to mama and daddy and, and, and tell them that what somebody did and all that and make it okay. It's not okay because then you just involved somebody else in a judgment, right? You created a different problem for you to have to deal with. But it doesn't make you feel better when you do those. Where do you take these things? First of all, you take it to the Lord. Then you, if you're asking Him for forgiveness for that, He says, go and be reconciled then he'll receive it. 
you see, because He asked you to do what He did. And that requires that you do it the way that He said. Now, that's the reason that I realize that even the church around the world has so much difficulty. It's not caused by God. It's not caused by others. It's caused by that knee-jerk reaction, that belief system that is not perfect inside of a person that doesn't have the revelation of God's uh, radical acceptance for them. That freedom comes again from faith and not fear. Freedom of responding but not reacting. Responding means you can say something to them, but it needs to be God-fed. It needs to come from love, not criticism, not your own self-rejection. It needs to be something that you allow God to do in you to heal you of all of these destructive ways. Let's look at a couple of scriptures here. 1 John 4.18, the New International, it says, There is no fear in love. So anything that's got fear in it is not love, right? But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So if you're obeying and you're doing what's good, is there any punishment? No, but there is that reciprocal law, you know, what you sow, you'll reap. So if you do the wrong thing, you're going to get the wrong thing. So because fear has to do with punishment, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. The problem is not with God. The problem is the person that refuses to receive their forgiveness from God. Receives, uh, for, they refuse to receive the salvation of God, the deliverance from self from God. And, and understand that when they do, then all of that rejection and all of that fear and all that anger and those things that you've been a part of go away. Then you can operate in love under any circumstance. 1 John 4, 12 says this, No one has seen God at any time. How many people have seen God at any time? No one. If we should love one another, God abides in us and His love is is having been perfected. That's, I want you to look at the tenses here. It's past tense. He had this plan for you from the beginning. God abides in us and His love is having been perfect and perfected in us. God wants to perfect His love in you. In the New American Standard Bible, no one has seen God at any time if we love one another. God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. It's conditioned on what? Our ability to love one another. And if you can't start with you, there's no way that you can love others. You'll be critical of others, judgmental of others the rest of your days. And that's not God. He says, don't judge anyone except yourself. You cannot do that and be pleasing to God. There's only one ju judge and He is not going to judge me because He's forgiven me. Understand that. But He will hold those things against you if you don't get it. If you continue in a, a, a rebellious state against Him and say, well, you know, you don't understand. Look, I understand. I understand you don't understand. You don't have that revelation yet. Okay? And there's a lot of people in, in, in religious circles today that will take option uh, against this, this very message because they don't understand. Very legalistic. I know what it is. I, I came up in that. And it took a while for God to get that out of me. Amen. <laughs> 1 John 4.17 says... Love is made perfect in us in order that we may have courage on the judgment day. And we will have it because our life in this world is the same as Christ's life. 
the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, in this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the, in the day of judgment for we are as He is in this world. Amen? Think about it. If we allow God's Spirit to have His way with us and quit telling God how to, how to raise His children, Amen? Love actually works better than criticism and judgment anyway, doesn't it? Don't you feel better when somebody uh, loves you and, and wants to be with you and not pushing you away? Okay. Each of these scriptures teach us to wake up from fears rooted in rejection, freeing ourselves from actions that push people away. Free yourselves and wake up from these chain reactions that have been a part of your life forever. In closing, there's three things I want to say to you. The Bible tells us not to, in anything, you know, we are to acknowledge Him. In all things, we are to acknowledge Him. And we're not to lean on our understanding. But all way, our ways, all our ways, acknowledge Him. And He will direct our path. He will tell us what to say. He will show us, you know, and we have to be slow to speak and quick to hear what God is saying. Don't believe everything you think. I promise you the devil has, uh, has breezed through your mind millions of times in your life. He has put things in your mind to make you get that knee-jerk reaction and, and then you come back not in love, not in respect of all that God loves, but you come back in something that is a lot less. Something that is condemning, and it's condemning you while you're doing it. Because that is where condem uh, condemnation comes from. It comes from Satan. Romans tells us what? There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. So, give yourself space to come back into God's presence when something happens to you. Learn to take a, a deep breath. Your brain needs that and your spirit does too. And, and give yourself a space before you speak. You'll be glad you did. You don't have to go home and, and justify your, your meanness because Satan wants you to be justified in yourself, right? And three... Please remember to love others as Christ loves you. God wants you to do that. And if you get this in your heart, in your mind, allow it to, to just infiltrate you, that revelation will change. All of those, those consequences will go away. All of those, those issues that you've been dealing with, that anger, that judgment, that fear, that all of that stuff... That, that is the salve. And salve is the first part of salvation. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name today, I ask You that somebody heard this and they listened all the way through. Heavenly Father, I ask Your Holy Spirit to put it in the hearts of men and women, children uh, and today, to listen to this message and ask God to have His way in their heart. Not to be afraid, God. You cast out. You said perfect love cast out fear because fear has in it that thought of punishment. And God has taken away all that is going to come to a believer through Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection. And Father, today we thank You for Jesus and His obedience. Let us be just as obedient and let us glorify Your name. Sanctify us all, Lord. Set us apart. Make us a different people. Let us come out of the world, Lord, and stop excusing worldliness in any form. We ask this so that we can glorify Your name, that we can be a light in this very dark time, and that many people will come to You through Jesus. Amen. Amen.